And let's turn once again to Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. Colossians, and this morning we're looking at chapter 3, verses 22 through to chapter 4 and verse 1. And once again, I want to read from verse 18, just so we get the, uh, the, the passage into its context. And Paul writes and says, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they won't become discouraged. Slaves, obey your human masters in everything. Don't work only while being watched as people pleases, but work wholeheartedly, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people, knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done, and there is no favoritism. Masters, Deal with your slaves justly and fairly, since you know that you too have a master in heaven. Father, we do pray and ask that you would speak to us through your word this morning. This word is a word which has relevance to every one of us today, and we pray, Father, that we might hear that, that we might appropriate it to ourselves, that we might be sanctified by you through your word, in the power of your Spirit. Amen. Well, as we come to this passage this morning, let me just once again remind you of the context into which Paul is writing this letter to the church at uh, Colossae. Uh, as a church, they had these false teachers who had come into the church who were teaching them that they needed something besides Christ. They, it was great that you've got Christ as your Lord and your Savior. That's Savior. That's wonderful. But there is more. There is something else. There is something better that you can have. And as long as you just add these things to your faith in Christ, to your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, that will uh, assist you greatly. Uh, and what really was happening was, as I said, those things started to eclipse Christ. Those things started to become bigger. And that's what always happens when you start to add things to uh, the pure salvation, the simple salvation that is ours in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Uh, immediately we start adding things, we start eclipsing Christ. So we start taking away from Christ. And in this case, they were adding things like ceremonialism. Oh, you need to observe the Sabbath and you need to be uh, circumcised. They were adding things like asceticism. Don't handle, don't touch, don't taste, don't do this, don't do that sort of thing. They were adding mysticism, uh, a kind of Gnosticism that was saying uh, you've got to have some kind of special knowledge and special experience. Uh, there were those who were adding traditions and philosophies, the philosophies of men, and uh, follow this tradition and follow that tradition. Basically, they were all coming and saying, yes, it's great being a Christian, but you can have a better life now. And that's why this is so relevant. That's what's being preached in so many churches today. Yes, it's wonderful having Christ, but there's so much more, and you can have so much of a better life. Life And what Paul is writing, as he's countering this, he's writing and saying to them, no, in Christ you have everything. In Christ uh, you are completely free. In, Cli in Christ you are complete. Uh, you don't need to add anything to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that makes your life better. And he makes it better in every aspect. And from verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 18, down to chapter 4 and verse 1, he's showing how our relationship with Christ makes our relationships with others better. Uh, I said, I think, last week that our relationships, uh, the gospel changes everything. 
uh, in our lives. It should change everything in our lives. And certainly, it changes all of our relationships. It doesn't just change our relationship with the Lord. Where once we were at enmity with Him, we were enemies of His. To now being His children, to being part of His family, to being reconciled to Him. It doesn't just change that, but it changes our relationships with everyone else and I would add, with everything else. And so in uh, verses 18 through to verse 21, he's showing how it changes our relationship with uh, our families, our wives and husbands and children and parents. Uh, in verses 22 through to chapter 4 and verse 1, he shows how it uh, changes our relationship with those that we work with. In our work situation, and I believe he's showing how it changes our relationship with our work itself. So that's where we are uh, this morning, looking at how this relationship with Christ changes and enriches our relationship with our colleagues, employers, with our employees, with our jobs, with our careers, and so on and so forth. And basically he's saying, this is the better way. Now, before we continue this morning, let me just give you a little bit of a uh, disclaimer. I don't want us this morning to become, and I'm not going to be referring to it uh, any more than what I'm just going to say right now, I don't want us to become sidetracked and uh, eclipsed with the whole question of slavery. And why does Paul not condemn it? Uh, in the situation, and there are many people who throw mud at the scriptures, as it were, to say that, you know, the scriptures endorse uh, slavery. Well, let me say to you, no, the scriptures don't endorse slavery, and the correct understanding of the scriptures will show you that, in fact, the scriptures teach us uh, the evil of slavery, that somebody could be uh, in bondage to another person, person and not in bondage to Christ and not in bondage to the law, that goes totally contrary to the whole of Scripture. The whole of Scripture teaches us to be free and to be free in Christ. And so there's no way you can endorse slavery from uh, the Scriptures. But I'm not going to spend my time this morning condemning slavery, just as Paul doesn't spend his time condemning it here because that's not his Agenda. This is not an ethical treatise on slavery. Let me say to you that what Paul does here is he comes with some absolutely radical views on the status of slaves and owners, which show you that uh, Paul wasn't simply a person who accepted slavery as it was practiced in those days as uh, something that was good and noble uh, in, in any way whatsoever. Uh, let me simply say this to you. I don't believe for a moment, though, that we, uh, and I just want to leave it at this, uh, I don't believe that we as Christians need to be making excuses. Uh, Paul doesn't ask us to make any excuses for him in terms of his view on slavery. He has nothing to be ashamed of. Of in terms of that. Neither do I believe we need to, to defend Christians who throughout the ages have had slaves and have owned slaves. Uh, I don't think we, can, we need to uh, defend them. Uh, they were men and women like us, sinful men and women. And if that was their sin, then we need to own it, that that was their sin, and, and leave it at that. But what we have here is Paul is saying you need to have a totally radical view of your relationship with those over whom you are, whom you are a master to, and with those to whom you are a servant or a slave, those to whom you are in subjection. And that's what it's all about. And so we come today and what we need to do is we need to apply this in terms of our uh, situations, uh, employers to employees, masters to servants, and, and so on and uh, so forth. Now, and I can say this confidently, 
I can say this because Paul, as he's writing this, just think about this context for a moment. Uh, Paul is writing to the church at Colossae. The pastor of that church was probably, just looking at the whole context, was probably uh, Archippus, if you go and have a look down at verse uh, 17. Tell Archippus, pay attention to the ministry you have received in the Lord so that you can accomplish it. So there is a, uh, he's calling on Archippus as a leader in the church, probably the pastor of the church. Now, Archippus was the son of Philemon. And uh, Philemon, as you know, was a slave owner. If you go to uh, the letter of Paul to Philemon, he's writing to him to uh, accept back the slave that he had had by the name of Onesimus. Uh, Onesimus, by the way, let me just say this. Onesimus, his name means useful. Think about this. He has a slave, you give him the name useful. That's how little they thought of the man. His name is just useful. And Onesimus had been a slave of Philemon. He had stolen something from Philemon and had run away from Philemon. Uh, because let me tell you, if you stole something from your master there were, uh, as a slave, there were only two ways out for you. Either to become a fugitive or to become dead. Those were the two options that were left open for you. Because, uh, yes, he could sell you, but who's going to buy a slave that steals or runs away? You see, so here is this Onesimus who's run away from Philemon. Now Paul writes to this church where Philemon is, and his son is the pastor of the church, and he sends the letter with useful. With Onesimus. So Onesimus comes to the church at uh, Colossae, and he is the one who's delivering this letter. Probably either he or Archippus were the ones who were going to be reading this letter to the church at Colossae. So when Paul is speaking here to slaves and masters and so on, he's speaking into a very prickly This is my position. This is how I'm going to obey you. You are the one who has employed me. You are the one who is paying my salary. You are the one who has been given authority over me. I am submitting myself to you. You don't have to come in every morning into the workplace and step on my head to get me to underneath you. I'm coming and I'm saying to you, how can I serve you today? How do I best meet the needs that you have today? You're coming in, you're submissive. It means being attentive, listening, as I mentioned last week. In other words, I'm coming to you today, what have you got for me to do? Let me hear, let me listen to the instructions. Let me listen carefully to the instructions. Let me listen attentively, uh, attentively to your instructions so that I can follow them out to the very letter of the law. Whatever it is you're asking me to do, I'm going to do it to the very best of my ability because I've heard exactly what you want done. I've heard your intentions. I've heard your desires. Uh, I've understood what it's about. So there's an attentiveness to it. When he says, slaves, obey your masters, it's a positive word. In other words, do it willingly. When we are employed by somebody to do a job we are to do that job willingly. Where's the spade? Where's the fork? Where's the this? Where's that? I want to do it, and I want to do it willingly. I'm not just here to do the absolute minimum and uh, get it paid for it. There was the lovely story about the uh, Irishman who was employed in a gang of workers, and uh, he was with the gang of workers and they were getting the pay. Is that not here today? Who's responsible for doing it here? 
every day of your life, you come into the office or you come into the workplace and that thing is there, you, need, you just take it for granted. You haven't thought for yourself, to yourself, who has actually made that be there uh, for me to use today or whatever. And sometimes we are the person who is having to make sure that uh, the glass of water is here beside uh, the pulpit. You know? Okay. There are times when there are th those sort of jobs. Nobody knows who does it. Until it's not done, then everybody knows who did it. And Paul is saying, even when nobody is going to know, nobody is going to praise you for doing that job, you do it and you do it wholeheartedly anyway. Not only when you expect to receive some sort of affirmation and praise, some sort of accolade, do it at all times. Let me say to you, not only the pleasant tasks. Slaves, obey your human masters in everything. Oh, well, I'll do that job because I like doing that job, but I'm not going to do this one because that, I don't like that job. No, in everything. If you're told to clean the toilets, you clean the toilets. If you're told to uh, do some wonderful big job that everybody's going to see and, and it's, a, it's a very pleasant job to do, you do all of them in obedience to the instructions that uh, are, are, are given. And you do each one with as much positivity uh, as the other. Do it, uh, the pleasant ones, uh, with as much positivity as what you do. Uh, do the unpleasant ones with as much positivity as what you do the pleasant ones. Do everything everything. But let me say to you, there are, of course, exceptions. There are some jobs that are sinful. There are some instructions that a boss or an employer or somebody might ask you to do or give you to do that is actually sinful. Well, what are you going to do then? Well, let me say to you, when it comes to that, you obey the Lord, not the Master. You obey the Lord, not the human master. And if that means that you may have to resign a job because it is leading you down a sinful path, well then you rather resign that job. So we must obey in everything, comprehensively. Thirdly, we are to obey in a consecrated way. In a consecrated way, notice what Paul says. He says, slaves, obey your human masters in everything. Don't work only while being watched as people pleasers, but work wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. Don't fear people. Fear the Lord. You see, let's, let's put it this way. Work was divinely instituted at creation before the fall. It's a good instruction that God has given to us. The fall just made work more difficult, but it was still the Lord who was the initial initiator, the initial commander, the initial delegator of work. And so when we are working, we are fulfilling His mandate to us. Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the, every living thing that moves on the earth. This is a command from the Lord, and every instruction we receive from human masters falls under that. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. And that's why Paul is saying, you obey your human masters not as people pleasers, but as God fearers. Ultimately, that is who you are serving. Look at what he says in verse 23. He says, whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people. What are you, if you're going to do it for the Lord, if you're going to do it as if you're doing it for the Lord, what does that mean? How would that look? How does that look in, in the way it plays out? I think it looks in this way. Gratitude. Gratitude. 
Beloved, whatever job you have to do, you need to be thankful, A, for the job. Whatever that job might be. It is something that God has given you to do. You need to be thankful for it. You need to be thankful for the ability to do the job. There are others who don't have that ability. There are others who don't have that privilege. Be grateful to God for the job that He's given you to do. However menial it might seem in the eyes of the world. Beloved, there's nothing menial in the eyes of God. If you do it as unto Him, let me tell you right now, it's not menial as far as He is concerned. Do it with sincerity. We're working for the Lord. We are to do it with sincerity. You know that you can never turn, He's never got His back turned. He's always going to be watching what you're doing. He always knows how you're doing. He always knows what your attitude is to the job you're doing. You can't hide that from Him. So do it with sincerity. Do it with reverence. If, if you are serving and you're serving as serving to the Lord, then you need to be doing it with reverence. All work is noble uh, because God is the one who's given us work. And so do it with reverence. Worshipping the Lord. Thanking the Lord, as I say, for the abilities that He's given you uh, to do that. And doing it in a way that will bring praise to His name. That's what we mean by working with reverence. Work with pride. Work with pride. Uh, because you're serving the Lord. Look, you might have the job of cleaning the floors. Well, if you're thinking that you're cleaning the floors, for me, you'll do it in one way. But if you think that you're doing the, cleaning the floors for the Lord, you'll do it in another way. Uh, look at the job I did for the Lord. Uh, remember Downton Abbey, how proud the servants were, those who were in service, for the fact that they were working not just for any old boss, but they were working for the Lord. They were working for uh, whoever the guy was. My, my great-grandfather was the master of the hounds. Uh, he was a master for the hounds. What that is, is he looked after the dogs. Uh, when they go on their hunts, uh, the dogs have to be brought out of the kennels and out of where they are kept. Uh, they have to be in the right condition. They have to have been properly fed, properly groomed and everything so that they could go and chase the foxes and show the huntsmen where the foxes were and so on. And so the master of the hounds, first of all, would have to make sure that the dogs were properly kept, properly fed, uh, properly housed, properly groomed, properly cared for in terms of their health. You looked after the dogs and you made sure when they went on the hunt, you controlled the dogs. The huntsmen are not controlling the dogs. They're looking for the fox and you control the dogs. So you're a keeper of dogs. Not a very high position, is it? I mean, not really the most noble of positions that you would think of. I'm a keeper of the dogs. But let me tell you, my great-grandfather, he was master of the hounds to the Earl of Warwick. You see, I can even say that with, proud, with pride. Beloved, think how much pride you can say what you are doing if you're doing it for the Lord. Oh, all I might have done was shun the bell, but boy did I shine it because it's for the Lord. That's the Lord's bell. Look at it and look at the way I've done it. He says, obey and serve your human masters in this way because ultimately you're serving the master, the Lord Christ, he says in verse 24. Secondly, we look at Paul's instruction to the masters. Now what I want you to do is I want you to drop down to chapter 4 and verse 1 here. So we'll just skip out verses 23 to 25. We'll come back to them in a moment under the heading of motivation. But I want you to just look now at chapter 4 and verse 1 where Paul now gives his attention and he gives his instructions to the masters. Masters, how are you to deal with your slaves? How are you to treat your slaves? Philemon, 
Archippus, how are you to treat Onesimus? You and I can read this. How are we to treat whoever is subordinate to us in whatever position we might be? How do I treat my servants? How do I entreat how do I treat employees? How do I treat my domestic worker? How do I treat my gardener? And all of those kinds of things. Well, Paul gives us three ways that we are uh, to do it. Firstly, he says, do it justly. Masters, deal with your slaves justly. Justly. The word means do it in a way that is right. In fact, it's the same word that is translated righteous. Or righteously. That's what he's saying. Treat your servants. Treat your slaves. Treat your subordinates. Treat your employees. Treat your workers righteously. In other words, you are to be righteous in the way you treat them. But Paul means more than that. He means do it in a way that is right. If they've done that job, you reward them in that way. If they've done this job, you reward them in this way. You do what is right. You do what is equitable. You do what fits, what is just. You do this in a way, and I believe what Paul is saying here is, do it in a way that keeps you innocent of any wrongdoing. And I think that's a good way to look at it. How do I treat those who work for me? Do I treat them in a way that keeps me innocent in the sight of God? Remember this. Slaves, you are to obey your human masters in everything. Don't work only while being watched as people pleasers, but work wholeheartedly fearing the Lord because He sees. Masters, He sees the way you're treating your workers. He sees it. Don't think you can get away with it. He sees it. So you need to be doing it in a way that will receive his approval and say, yes, that was good. Well done, good and faithful servant in the way you've treated your servant. So do it justly. How does God think about the way you have treated those who work for you? Oh, you might have been able to come and say, this is what the law says, and therefore that's all I'm going to do for you at this point in time. And so often I hear that kind of thing where uh, people say, no, well, this is what I asked my domestic worker to do, this is what I asked my gardener to do, and they did it, they made a mistake here, they did that, they blew it there, and that sort of thing, so I'm deducting that off their wages, and, and that's it. Well, legally you can do that, and that's fine, but let me ask you, let me ask you, what does God think about that? Philemon, Archippus, you guys were so upset and so angry and so venomous when Onesimus stole from you and ran. But let me ask you, why did he steal that? What drove him to stealing that? What kind of context was he working in that made him do that? Examine yourself, you see. And that's the way we need to be thinking about it when we have anybody who's in our employ. How does God consider the way that I'm treating these people? Secondly, he says you are to do it fairly. Deal with your slaves justly and fairly, with equity. That's what it means, with equity. In other words, without partiality. Without favoritism. Equal pay for equal work. Equal pay for equal work. Irrespective of the person's race, irrespective of their ethnicity, irrespective of their gender, irrespective of their age, you pay them what the job is worth. Equal pay for equal job. Don't employ that poor old guy 
and say, oh, well, that's fine, he's old, so he'll, be th- he'll, he'll just be grateful for this little bit that we can give him, so let's pay him that. No, no. If he's doing job A, you pay him salary A. If he's doing job B, you pay him salary B. Likewise with women, likewise with people of other races, whatever it might be, treat them with equity, fairly, without partiality. And I think the way to judge that is this. Treat them in the way you would want them to treat you if the roles were reversed. If I was the employee and he was the employer or she was the employer, what would I expect from them in this situation? Matthew 7 verse 12, Therefore, whatever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them, for this is the law and the prophets. Matthew chapter 19 verse 19, Love your neighbor as yourself. Beloved, that fairly, I believe, means to put yourself in the shoes of the other person. Thirdly, do it humbly. Treat them humbly. Look what he says. uh, Since you too know, sorry, since you know that you too have a master in heaven. You have the Lord in heaven. You're not just a little free agent, a law unto yourself. You are under a master. You see, when it comes to these situations, we need to stop and say to ourselves, who do I think I am? Who do I think I am? I am. It's very easy for us to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to, particularly when we are in positions of authority. I've worked hard for this. I've built myself up. I've pulled myself up by my bootstraps. I've got to this point, and therefore I have the right to do this and to do that and to treat these people under me in this way or that way or the next thing. Paul says this in Romans in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. For who makes you so superior? What do you have that you did not receive? If in fact you did receive it, why do you boast as if you hadn't received it? Beloved, it's very easy to see people in high positions and people with lots of power being absolutely dismissive of those who are under them as if they themselves are superior to these people. Beloved, in God's eyes, they are your absolute equal. They are your equal. And you are to treat them in that way. He is their Lord. And he is your Lord. And particularly if they are fellow Christians. Romans 12 and verse 3. For the grace given to me, I tell you, to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Oh yes, I might have some kind of intellectual ability that has enabled me to get some kind of academic qualification, that has enabled me to get some kind of professional qualification, that has enabled me to get into this job, and has enabled me to earn this amount of money, that has enabled me to employ this guy to dig my garden. Am I any better than him? Oh, maybe if we did an IQ test, I may come out better than him. I'm not saying I will because he may not have had the same opportunities that I've had to get to that position. But let's say that that I do have an IQ that is better than his IQ. But let me tell you this right now, he will work that spade all day in a better way than what I could. When it comes to physicality, he's my superior. He has abilities that I don't have. He has knowledge that I don't have. What makes me superior? To him. So we are to do it humbly, realizing A, that the Lord is the one who is the Lord over us all, and whatever I have, whatever abilities I have, and position I have, I have received them 
by the grace of God. There, but for the grace of God, go I. And then last of all, beloved, let's just look at the motivation. In verses 23 to 25, he's dealing with motivation. Now, many interpreters, many uh, um, commentators include verses 23 through to verse 25 under the teaching to the slaves. And they say things like, oh, well, he says so much more to slaves than what he does to masters because there were more slaves than what there were masters. Uh, no, I don't believe that what Paul is doing at all. In fact, I believe that verses 23 to 25 are bridging verses. I believe verse 22 is speaking to the slaves specifically. In verses chapter 4 and verse 1, he's speaking to the master specifically. But in verses 23 to 25, he's giving the rationale. He's giving the motivation uh, for why both of these groups should uh, obey in the way that he's told them to obey. In other words, they are hinge verses, I believe, and they all are motivational, both for slaves and for masters. So you notice that verse 23 starts off as if it's referring to the slaves. Whatever you do, and he's been speaking to the slaves, whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done uh, for the Lord and not for people. But immediately we realize that he's saying that, immediately we realize that that basically does include everybody. Nobody's exempt from that. Verse 24, he says, Knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord, you serve the Lord Christ. That is true of everybody, you slaves and masters. And verse 25, he says, For the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done, and there is no favoritism. That underlines it. That underscores it. I'm not just speaking to the slaves here. I'm speaking to the masters as well. Because there is no favoritism. So you see, uh, I believe these are, are um, motivational. They, they, they give the rationale for both masters and for uh, slaves. Now, notice what he does here. He says that all of us, whatever our position, whatever our station uh, in life, in terms of our work situation, this is what we are to do. Whatever you do, do it from the heart. Notice that, do it from the heart. It must be sincere. Uh, in Greek, it really means from the soul. Uh, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord, not for people. So in other words, you are working. Go back to those Genesis uh, mandates that were given, the, 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 the creation mandate that was given to us. Uh, you are serving the Lord. That's who you are ultimately serving. And then he tells us that we are to do it in two ways. Firstly, verse 24, you are to do it positively. There's a positive motivation. You know that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. If you're a slave, you need to do this positively. You need to... Be doing it. Don't do it the way Onesimus did it, where he stole from his master. That was wrong. And don't do it in that way, because you know that you are going to receive a reward. If you've done things right, you receive a reward from the Lord Christ. But masters, as I said, when you are doing it justly, make sure that you're doing it righteously, because you, your reward is going to be from the Lord. That's ultimately where it comes from. But then he also tells us, he gives us the negative motivation. Verse 25, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done, and there is no favoritism. Oh yes, you might have been able to get away with doing wrong things and not doing the job the way you should do it. Your boss might not have found out about it, or your employees may not have found out about it. You might be able to get away with it. But the Lord sees. 
and He will pay back whatever wrong has been done because there is no favoritism. God looks at us, neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. So work positively, knowing that you will receive a reward from the Lord for the work that you've done, and work, uh, be motivated from the negative side, because the Lord repays. So let me end with this. Who do you serve? Who do you serve? That's really the bottom line of what Paul is saying here. As masters, whatever position you might have that has put you in authority over others, ask yourself this, who am I serving? If you're a servant, serving under somebody else, ask yourself the question, who ultimately do I serve? And then let me ask you another question. How does it show? How does it show who you are serving? Because let me tell you, it does show. Amen. Father, we, we thank you for work. We thank you that work is a noble thing. We thank you that work is a godly thing. And Lord, we know that so often we have a uh, negative view of work, a begrudging view of work. But we thank you, Lord, that you are the one who has ordained it. And we pray, Father, that you would help each one of us to consider how we work and particularly how we treat others with whom, for whom uh, we work or above whom we work. May we do it, Lord, in a way that shows that we are serving you. That brings glory to your name. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.